Um, I'm actually Samatsu. I'm the Industry Engagement and Innovation Man Manager with Federation University based here at the Model Innovation Centre. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are gathering, the Gunai Kanai people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. On behalf of Fed Uni and our event partners, the Tri Valley Authority and Regional Development Victoria, it's my pleasure to welcome you along here to our first event for the 2024 Innovation Breakfast Series. Um, a quick thank you to everybody who attended our event series last year and helped to make it a success. And also a big thank you to everybody who responded to the survey that we did at the end of, end of last year of our series as well. We got some really great feedback and we will be incorporating that into our series this year. So thank you for your efforts with that too. Um, for our session today, I would like to welcome our speakers and panel members who we'll hear from shortly. They are Dr. Carol, sorry, Dr. Matthew Carroll from Rural Health Monash University, Dr. <coughs> Sue Yell from Federation University, Dr. Lika Sheepers from the University of Tasmania, who will be joining us online today, and Jane Anderson, the Latrobe Valley Health Advocate. I was waiting for the doctor in front of there. Um, I'd also, um, uh, before we move on, I'll just add a few um, housekeeping reminders. So we are holding this event as a combined in-person and online, online session. Um, for those of you who haven't attended before, um, just be aware that there are inbuilt in microphones that remain live throughout the event and they are quite sensitive, so they will pick up anything um, that is mentioned throughout the room. We will be recording the session today, which will be made, made available for future reference. And lastly, if you could just please check that your mobile phones are either on off or on silent for the, for the event, that would be great. Our session today is um, a lead up event, to the, a community day that's being held tomorrow at Kernot Hall, acknowledging 10 years since the Hazelwood mine fire. Um, there's some more details on the flyer on your table if you um, aren't aware of that event already. <coughs> So following some concerns raised by the community about potential health impacts resulting from the fire, the Victorian government supported development of a Hazelwood health study. The study was designed to monitor long-term health impacts of Latrobe Valley. Today we'll hear from three of the researchers working on this 10-year longitudinal study and they'll share some of their findings and lessons with us across three different research streams within the study and we'll consider how the application of this knowledge can be useful for our region but to other communities as well. So we will have um, yeah, three presenters who will um, each present for about 10, 10 minutes each and then we'll have a panel discussion after that. I'll introduce our first speaker today, Matthew Carroll. Dr Matthew Carroll is co-principal investigator for the health study and senior research fellow within the Monash School of Rural Health at Churchill. Matthew has been involved in the Hazelwood study from its inception and leads the psychological impact stream as well as being a collaborator in other stream activities. And I'll hand over to Matthew now um, to begin our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you everybody for coming today and for having us here. We, we're really, this year is our, our last year of the first 10 years of the Hazelwood study, so we're really committed to being out everywhere, telling everybody what, what we found and what it might mean and trying to have those conversations. So if you want to come and talk to us, get in contact and we'll, we'll come out to you. Because people don't come to us, we've got to go to them, which is wonderful. So I've got three streams, as Lisa said. Um, I've got Sue Yell in, in the front here, we'll present from a community wellbeing stream, and Sue's an adjunct senior research fellow at the Institute of Education, Arts and Community at Fed Uni Gippsland. And she leads the community wellbeing stream within the study, which is looking at the, the broader impacts of the mine fire. Lika is in Tas no, no, Lika's in Tasmania, <laughs> no, that's right. Lika is a, an epidemiologist and research fellow at the Menzies Institute at the University of Tasmania, and Leek is a new research fellow on the early life follow-up child development stream, which is looking at the impacts on pregnant mothers at the time and on children who are either in utero or have just been born at the time of the month And at the end of our, our three presentations, we'll pass on to Jane Anderson, who's our uh, health advocate, to give us her reflections. Jane was appointed um, as the health advocate in 2018. That's so long ago, Jane, um, um, by the health minister. <laughs> Reappointed in 2021, so they must be doing a good job. And it's the first rock of its kind, so really an unusual role 
really great to see that this region's got that sort of support. And Jane advocates up to government about the concerns within the community. So that is an amazing thing. So let's get started. If this works, here we go. Right, I might stand over here. Um, so we just want to give you a, a bit of an overview of the study and what, what we've learned and what it might mean. Um, for those that weren't here at the time, lucky you, um, it was a, a bushfire that quickly escalated into the mine and then very much <laughs> over the next six weeks became a public health event. So it changed its focus across time. Um, and there were community concerns raised right from the beginning in terms of people suffering various symptoms. So asthma was getting worse, eyes, coughing, just really lots and lots of different things. So lots of community complaints, lots of fear about what's this exposure going to do to me over the long term? Will this result in cancers, things like that? Um, the response initially from the Department of Health is there's no evidence in the literature about the effects of coal mine fire smoke. Nothing had ever been published, no, no, no research being done, but there was clear evidence in the community about the impacts of the mine fire. Um, and so because of those community concerns, because the community activated, because of groups like Voices of the Valley and more neighbourhood house, that there was a, a really strong call from the community for something more to be done. Petition of 20,000 plus signatures were, were established. Government came out very rapidly after the mine fire in May 2014, consulted with the community, consulted with service providers, found out what the core concerns were, and then used them to create research questions for a proposed health study, put out a request for tender, and then we put up our hands and quite amazingly got um, funded for 10 years for the Hazelwood Health Study. Now, that 10-year program is nothing that anyone's ever seen before. No one's ever seen a research program funded for 10 years. It broke our, our budget capacities. We, couldn't, we didn't have a system for coming up with a 10-year budget. Um, um, so it makes us quite a unique study, not just in, in length but in scope because we've got so many different areas that we focus on, <laughs> so many populations we focus on, so many different methodologies. We'll see some of those today. Um, um, but also the, the, the um, health innovation, no, the mine fire inquiry, sorry guys, um, um, really made it clear that the impacts of the mine fire were very much on a community that was already impacted by major health inequalities and by major changes over time. This was just one insult on the community over time. The privatisation of the power sector 20 years before was still working its way through. And so this was just another thing, but also the opportunity for us to connect into the health assembly and the innovation zone and the advocate. Those things that were coming as a result of the mine fire makes us a really unique study. And we think we're providing critical answers, both in terms of the short and long-term impacts of the mine fire, but also sewage work on community wellbeing. But we're finding information about the general health of the community, not just mine fire stuff. So we've released information on nutrition, on smoking, on e-cigarettes, on asthma control, on various other things that we're really trying to make sure anything that's relevant to public health, we get out there. So we think we're informing local, state and national responses. This is just a very basic description of the study. We're only today going to talk about three of our streams. I'll talk about the site impacts. Sue will talk about community wellbeing. And Lee will come on and talk about the early life follow-up child development stream. We're not really going to talk about the big adult survey that we did, other than where it links into my stream, or about the, the clinical assessments on respiratory and cardiovascular health, or about the massive amount of work that our stream for Hazelings is doing, where they're analysing pharmaceutical benefits, they're analysing Medicare, they're analysing cancer, they're analysing hospital, ambulance, any data set they can find. So there's a lot more we can't fit it in in, in a rapid presentation. So if you want to see more, come get us and we'll show you more. So this is my stream and that's my team who are assisting me with the stream. So this first finding is to do with the Big Adult Survey that went out in 2016, 2017, about 3,000 people in Morwell compared to 1,000 people in, in sales out in trials. We inserted in the survey two measures of distress. One was to do with mine fire related distress, which specifically says, thinking about the mine fire, are you having trouble sleeping as a result? Are you thinking about the mine fire? Are you not thinking about the mine fire? Are you more reactive to smoke? Those sorts of post-traumatic stress symptoms, as well as a measure of general distress. And we found that both of those were, were moderate levels across the community, with a range from, from little to high, but a really clear relationship between level of smoke exposure. People who had more exposure to the smoke based on the diary and the, the modelling that we've got 
had a lot more distress than people who had less exposure to smoke. And it went up in a really clear stepwise fashion. Particular groups were more vulnerable, so people who were um, under 35, young adults were more vulnerable. Um, but we also found, we went back three years afterwards, so that's about three years after the event, we went back again and researched them three years after that, and we, in, in 2019, 2020, and we found that people were still reporting distress associated with mine fire, and was actually more associated with, with the, the level of smoke that they had back in 2014. So it's reaching back six years. People who were more exposed back six years before were experiencing more distress that they associated with the mine fire. That's unusual. We wouldn't have thought that it would, would, would still be happening six years later. And in fact, from the graph, you can see it got bigger. So the yellowy colour is the, the first round, the reddish colour is the second round, and basically each of them jumped, the low, medium and high exposures, all jumped in that second survey. And we're, we're pretty confident that's because the timing of the second survey happened to coincide with Black Summer. And so the smoking effect, we all remember Black Summer smoking, <laughs> covered the state was reminding people about that mine fire. It was re-triggering them about what was what was going on, what would happen back then. We had people calling us saying, it's just as bad as last time. The fire's going to get to us, even though the reports were fairly clear the fires weren't that close to us. Um, so it was really um, traumatising a number of people. So that's a real evidence there that how events do load on each other, as we've seen, as we're seeing this week. Um, um, repeat events do have a, have a, a bigger impact. This is a complicated slide. Don't expect you to follow this, but this is just talking about that transition of distress. That some people, and luckily for us, the bulk of people were low level distress at the first round survey and the second round survey. 77% weren't that worried about it, but the other quarter of the population were impacted. Some people were impacted at the first survey, but they dropped back down, so they're in recovery. Some people weren't impacted at the first survey. But they went up by the second, perhaps because of Black Saturday. So they they were delayed and said some people were, were distressed at both rounds, so they're more chronic. And the sort of risk factors for that ongoing distress are things like lack of social support and loneliness, prior traumas, um, prior um, stressful events in the last year, or having mental health and physical health diagnoses. Which are, it's really important to have that understanding of the risk factors. But the the uh, the protective factors are things like access to social support, higher education and employment. Now this, again, you don't really need to follow the, the, the graph all that much, but we've also had a lot of work with school aged children. We actually got out about a year or so after the mine fire and we surveyed kids in more well compared to the rest of the Trail Valley. We went out again a couple of years later and resurveyed them and we did the kids who were in the Napoleon years at the time we went so we could have access to their Napoleon schools a month at the time. And again, we found the kids were moderately distressed in that first survey. Really pleased to see when we went out again that the stress levels had gone down in the second survey, not coinciding with another bushfire event, luckily. Um, but what you did find in that first round was that about a quarter of the kids had clinically concerning distress levels. So the department very rapidly jumped in at that point and said, right, and they actually increased access to, to mental health services for, for kids at that point and created a pathway to try and find those guys and, and, and weed them through. But what we found, as expected, was that the kids in Morwell were more impacted than the kids outside Morwell, and that's a combination of both the smoke and the impacts on the schools, because a number of Morwell schools had to relocate. That was a massive impact. And other schools were doing lots of diversion activities and so on. So the Morwell schools were much more impacted physically by the event than the other schools. Interestingly, the primary school kids, it didn't matter whether they were more well versus the rest of the valley, the primary school kids were, were, were the same level of stress regardless. And we think that's because little kids are less able to judge their own personal level of risk. They're more impacted by what's around them, by all the media and so on that was happening. And so they were responding that way. NAPLAN was really powerful. Um, what we found in the end of NAPLAN was that there was something like a four to five month delay in the Morwell students. So the red line at the bottom of each of those Napoleon domain areas is Morwell and the grey bar going down is the Hazelwood event. And you can see in every one of them there's a drop across Hazelwood and the lines then start to gradually work their way back up. But they don't make it back up to where you would expect them to have been so that they didn't actually recover over four years of Napoleon rounds afterwards. So that's quite a big drop that, that, that um, we we're quite surprised to see just how strong that was. So as I said, we've got a big hazeling stream that's looking at existing data sets. 
So what we know is during the mine fire, we looked at emergency department presentations and ambulances, and we saw a, a clear change in mental health related um, presentations. So 38% um, increase in ambulance call less mental health, 13% increase overall for mental health, um, sorry, for anxiety, 36% um, increase in presentations of DED for depression, and similar sorts of increases within the community for mental health related GP um, presentations, clinic specialist presentations, and psychiatric medications. So, a lot of evidence that there, there was increased mental health service usage during the mine fire. So, for us from the psych stream, the key lessons are that a smoke event is an event in and of itself. No one really understood that at the time, and no one had gone through such a long event, but we'd now all gone through Black Summer and we all experienced another really extended smoke event, and it's not a good thing. So it's an event in on itself and it needs to be taken seriously, and services need to prepare and actually um, um, take time to know what's coming, to actually have the services available, to know that there are vulnerable groups who are more impacted. So younger people, people with prior mental health and physical diagnoses, people with prior traumas, things like that. But also to, to, to look at what supports can be put into schools to try and prevent that sort of a drop going forward. <coughs> Lots of lessons we think in terms of, of where to next. So where we're at now, we've got a survey we finished a year or so ago that we're still analysing. And that's our, our third round survey where we're, we're looking to see that distress levels have come back down. Which is, which is great, um, but we're also wanting to look at the, uh, the relationship with Black Summer and COVID-19 and other factors. We're very much looking at the links between families and children. We're working closely with the, the health stream on that one, and we're looking to sue in terms of the connection between individual and community wellbeing. Um, we have noticed in the latest survey data that there's, a, there's an increasing level of distress within the community and trying to understand what that is, and that's probably all the other factors going on, like COVID and so on. So we want to explore that. Um, but in the next 10 years, we're really keen to look at other outcomes, other data sets we haven't had a chance to touch, like criminal stats, domestic violence, that sort of stuff, which, you know, you, you have to think that there's something like that in the data set. Um, wider educational outcomes. So we've looked at, at schools and NAPLAN, what about um, what progression to universities, that sort of thing. So there's a lot more that we can look at over the longer term. And we're really keen to keep working with the, the innovation zone and with the, the assembly and, and Jane, the advocate, about where this can go. And perhaps as we go forward to something more than focusing on a, um, a, an observational study, to actually be more involved in doing all things. So maybe there might be an opportunity to come up with, with um, interventions to address some of these issues and work with all the partners to actually do more about that. So. Who knows whether we have another 10 years, but that's what we're hoping for. So that's the, the psych stream. I'll now hand over to Sue from the Community Wellbeing Stream. So, hi everyone. Um, this is us, or plus uh, myself and Matthew, who's also involved in the Community Wellbeing Stream. And um, we've been tra tracking community wellbeing and recovery in Latrobe since the mine fire and just popped up a definition of community wellbeing because it does seem like one of those rather woolly terms, but it basically boils down to um, it's about how the community functions, sees itself and talks about itself, um, and it's also about the conditions that enable community members to flourish. So our focus in the first few years was on the impact of the mine fire, particularly on community wellbeing. Um, and along with that, we looked at the effectiveness of communication during the fire and the recovery process. And the roses image you see up here on the slide um, comes from um, a community recovery activity that we conducted it back in 2017. Um, and what we did was work with community members and community groups to create 28 photographic images resulting in a photo exhibition and that actually toured down to State Parliament, uh, Victorian State Parliament was exhibited in Queen's Hall um, and currently it's uh, just moved to the Health Assembly so you can go and see it there, um, well worth a look. 
So our analysis is based on interviews. We do qualitative research, which is a bit different to a lot of the methodologies in other parts of the health study. Um, so we talk to over 130 people in individual interviews and also focus groups over the last nine years. And we've also scanned through thousands of media reports and social media posts. And we're very grateful to all those people who gave their time and put their trust in us by sharing their insights and experiences. So we found that the mine fire had a substantial impact on community wellbeing and most notably a loss of trust in the authorities dealing with the crisis. And the main reasons for that loss of trust stem from problems with communications during the crisis and also the lack of an appropriate <coughs> plan for this kind of emergency and Matthews alluded to the <coughs> importance of having a smoke plan. Um, it was a long-lasting emergency, as, as those of you who lived through it know, um, so it was, it's, was fairly unprecedented. The community also felt that communication was too one-way, it was lacking in empathy at times, and advice given was inconsistent and failed to recognise their concerns and their direct experiences. Another of our key findings related to the role played by social media during and after the event. And we found that social media took on a role of filling the information gaps, um, information vacuum in the official communication. And of course, at the same time, also spread some information that wasn't quite accurate. So pitfalls, but also benefits. Facebook in particular emerged as a space for local forums for advocacy, support and activism while also reflecting some of the conflicts and divisions in this very diverse community. In terms of recovery, we found there were a range of recovery activities, but not all of those were valued by the community. And the ones that were valued involved a genuine partnership between agency and community group. Um, and one example of that was after the mine fire, the EPA met with Voices of the Valley, um, who'd been very active in expressing their concerns about well, a number of things, but including how air quality was being measured. And out of that discussion, the EPA and Voices of Valley jointly developed a citizen science project monitoring air quality. So that's the type of recovery project that builds trust and strong relationships because it's an authentic partnership. So some of the key lessons that have come out of this research, I'll just highlight a few of the ones um, up there relating to those three main areas, disaster planning, communication and recovery. So the lack of a specific plan um, for a mine fire or a smoke event was a major criticism from the community and future planning needs to cater for a range of potential events, including a smoke event. In regards to emergency communication, a uh, very strong theme to emerge was that communication should be led or guided by a local communications team because there is that expertise here and, and local people working in comms know how this community likes to be um, communicated with. Um, another strong theme was that it should involve a trusted, preferably local spokesperson. Communication should be dialogic. Uh, there's always that um, need to provide very um, direct, top-down communication during an emergency, but there's also very importantly a need to listen to the community um, and take on more of their concerns. And in terms of recovery, I've already mentioned the importance of genuine partnerships in the recovery phase. Recovery agencies need to be willing to network with community groups and take a participatory and inclusive approach. In a disaster, the most impacted are those most vulnerable, and I see Tracy's here and knows that very well, and we've heard that message particularly strongly um, in our interviews. So there's a need to build resilience across all sectors of the community, and building this resilience is also important for preparing and planning for the next disaster. So disaster planning and response and recovery really is a cyclical thing where all, or particularly recovery and planning should be happening continuously. 
Um, so these are the principles that have come very strongly from our interviews and they're well understood, I think, at the local level. Um, perhaps there's some still some work to be done um, at other levels. But since the mine fire, there's been a policy shift, a very positive one at the state level, towards community-based emergency management that embeds many of these principles. And just recently we've had the opportunity to share these and other health study findings with um, both the municipal and the regional emergency management communities, and that's opening up a really positive discussion. So in terms of our current work, for the last few years we've broadened our focus um, not specifically to look at mine fire impacts but to consider broader impacts on community wellbeing and as Matthew mentioned there's been a, a series of adverse um, events that this community has experienced um, and a series of adversities and currently facing a number of challenges including the transition away from carbon. So our aim is to contribute to a conversation about the future for this region by identifying what this community, what makes this community resilient, as well as its areas of vulnerability. So our main focus currently has been the development of what we call a community wellbeing barometer for the Latrobe Valley. So very specifically um, designed for this region. Um, there are other barometers, wellbeing indicators, happiness indicators, um, quality of life indicators floating around. Um, at state and national levels, but the idea is to make this one specific to this region. And it's a tool that draws on publicly available data sets. So we're using a lot of census data from the ABS, we're using data from the Victorian Population Health Survey and a whole range of other data sources. And it's designed around these five key domains, so health, the economy, the environment, social connections and services and infrastructure. And then within each of those domains you can see, um, there's, well, I hope you can see that in the finer print, um, a number of themes. And for each of those themes, that's where our data sets come in. We find measures that seem to relate to those themes um, and take that data across a series of time points um, and enter it and perform some calculations, which are very mysterious to me, but which one uh, our colleague, um, Damien Morgan, is the expert at. Uh, when the data is compiled, these changes can be displayed in a graph and mapped um, against major events like COVID or the closure of Hazelwood or the mine fire. And we're currently finalising the analysis of that data and look forward to sharing it when it's completed. The aim is to make the barometer an accessible tool that can be widely shared and used by local governments and, uh, and other organisations working in the space of community wellbeing and community development. Um, and in terms of proposed future work, we hope to continue, if we're funded, to continue to study um, the impacts on this community of repeated adverse events including transition um, and also conduct further development on the barometer to make it a truly public facing tool and to give it a, a digital presence. So that's it from me. Thank you and I'll hand it to So um, Mika's now going to talk about the early life follow-up study. Mm -hmm. Mika, just say next slide and I'll press the button for you. Go. See Mika looking at them. You can start talking, Mika, whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, sorry I still had to unmute myself. So my name is Lika, I'm a researcher at the Menzies Institute in Tasmania. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, I would have loved to. Um, today I will be leading you through the main results of the Latrobe Early Life and Follow-up Study, which focuses on the health and growth of children. Next slide please. So who have we been following over the years? This includes the women who were pregnant during the fire smoke periods, and we look at pregnancy-related health outcomes. 
<coughs> Secondly, uh, we investigated the children whose mothers were pregnant with them at the time of the fire. So these children were exposed in the womb and we look at the health outcomes of uh, the children. And last, we also studied the children who were younger than two years when the fire actually happened. Next slide, please. Thanks. So how have we been learning about their health? We did several things. We sent out uh, several questionnaires to collect information on their demographics, uh, on several uh, symptoms, for example, cough and respiratory function, and medication use, like antibiotics. Second is that we, that we invited the children to attend three clinics. The clinics were held three, seven, and nine years after the fire. We, we tested their respiratory and cardiovascular health and also took several blood samples. Lastly, um, we also uh, collected data through data linkage, uh, and which provided information about their healthcare uh, service use, <laughs> such as whether they visited their GPs, uh, about their MBS and PBS data. And uh, this meant that we were able to study the birth, health, and educational outcomes of the children in the entire La Trobe Valley. Next slide, please. Now I will, uh, I will be leading you through the main results. We found that pregnant women exposed to the smoke of the fire had an increased uh, risk of diabetes in pregnancy compared to those who were not exposed to the fire. We showed that a total of 16 additional cases were attributed to, to the mine fire uh, smoke exposure. This is uh, important for both the health of the mothers and the baby. We also showed that the babies born to the mothers with pregnancy-related diabetes were on average 100 grams heavier. Next slide, please. Secondly, uh, we studied the health of the children whose mothers were pregnant with them at the time of the fire. In other words, who were exposed in the womb. The children were more likely to present at the emergency department for skin rashes and allergy, but luckily we did not find um, any uh, other increased uptake for ED presentations. We also found that they had a higher use of systemic steroids like prednisone tablets, which were mostly prescribed for treating serious asthma and croup. Also, the children were exposed in the womb were um, uh, more often experienced cough uh, and colds up to three years of age. This data was collected every month uh, and was self-reported by the parents. Lastly, seven years after the fire, we saw when, they, when the children attended the clinic that they had slightly stiffer blood vessels. Uh, I say slightly since the changes were very small and we don't actually know whether it's uh, clinically relevant or not. Then third, we looked at those who were exposed when the kids were, when they were very young, so up to two years of age. We showed that in what, that uh, one year after the fire, there was an increased uh, disp dispensation of antibiotics. They were more often uh, they more often visit the emergency depart department for respiratory and infectious conditions. Two years after the fire, we still saw that the children more often used antibiotics. And three years after the fire, when they visited the first clinic, we saw that, that the children who were exposed to the, fire, uh, to the fire had stiffer blood vessels and stiffer lungs. But again, the changes were very small and the clinical importance uh, is uncertain. Seven years after the fire, the children attended the clinic again. This time, the, the, the poorer lung and cardiovascular health was no longer observed, so they showed some recovery, which is great news, obviously, for the children and for the parents. So the changes seem only to be short-term, and catch-up growth may have occurred. So far, uh, the results of the mine fire related exposure. We also looked at uh, the exposure which we are uh, daily um, exposed to. This is also called outdoor air pollution. 
um, exposure to higher outdoor air pollution is associated with overall increased uh, visits to the to the emergency department, uh, and uh, also for and particularly also for the emergency departments uh, for infec infectious conditions. We also saw that people who have a higher exposure to outdoor pollutants um, more often visit their GP and uh, have an increased uptake of antibiotic use as well. So, but what is our impact so far? Um, the, um, since this is the first, as, 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 as Matthew mentioned, this is the first study where we actually looked at the long-term effects of a very severe smoke event. And our results has, have influenced the national and international guidelines for how to deal with wildfire smoke exposure. We identified uh, people at risk, which are pregnant women, babies and young children. And we also showed that um, there are short but also long-term health consequences. We emphasize that those, uh, that those people at risk should be protected from air pollution, uh, especially in the case of an extended lo uh, location-specific smoke event, like mine fires and peat fires, but that we should not only focus on severe smoke events, but actually also on our uh, daily uh, exposure to air pollution as well. We should support uh, overall health to increase the resilience to unavoidable air pollution. This can be through maternal and child health care, uh, antenatal care and support for young families. Next slide, please. So um, at the end of 2023, nine years after the fire, we had our last clinic, at least so far, and we collected again data on respiratory and vascular function. Um, we started the analysis, but unfortunately we have no data to show yet. Obviously, we hope that for any, for any of the other findings we had previously, uh, so three, and seven years after the fire, that the date that the kids have recovered and don't show any health uh, effects anymore. Another study which, which will be conducted is that we look at educational outcomes, for example, Neplin scores, but also behavioral and cognitive outcomes and neurodevelopmental outcomes. This will all be done through linkage data. Uh, for neurodevelopment outcomes, you can think, for example, on uh, HDHD. Depending on the future, uh, depending on the future, and depending on the funding, uh, if we receive it, the, our future aspirations are to continue to continue monitoring the ongoing health of children affected by the fire smoke, and to determine if any negative health effects persist or resolve over time. This is particularly important since the children will soon um, uh, reach the age of puberty, and uh, then after obviously become other, uh, other adolescents and young adults. Um, I would say a particular high thanks to uh, the, the stream leader, uh, Faye Johnson, and to all our collaborators, staff, students, and other contributors as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lika. And as you can see, the ELF study is almost as big as the rest of the Hazelwood study. It was huge. When the government originally put out the request to tender, they only asked for looking at the impact on birth weight because there was evidence out there that exposures might lead to reduce birth weight. But Faye and the team said, no, there's a lot more questions we can ask. And they ended up putting up, and they're already out here doing some work um, following the mine fire. So that they put in a really major proposal together and we're getting some incredible results. So I just wanted on the final slide, give a concluding summary to say that this is just a snapshot. As I said, this is just a couple of our streams. We've got a lot more stuff and a lot more stuff within it, within each of our streams as well. So we're always happy to share. Please go to our website, which is on the next slide. Everything we get goes to our website first. Um, the, we're committed and the government was committed for us to get stuff out to the community as fast as we can. But we want to come out to any group that wants to see us. So please get in contact with us. But the one thing we have got across all our streams is there is clear evidence that the smoke event had an impact. It was early and ongoing, um, but we are really pleased to see that some of those impacts may be starting to dissipate. And I can say that the adult respiratory stream, um, doing similar sort of work to the elf stream, also found that in their second round of assessment, some of the, the first round um, issues in terms of stiffer lungs had started to wash out. 
And again, they, they've just done their third round and they're analysing that. So we're hoping to see that some of those effects have, have, have modified as well. Um, there is a need for more research in long latency outcomes like cancers because that was a big concern of the community. We've done two sets of analysis so far. We did one five years on, which is really just giving us the baseline data. Cancers take normally 10, 20 more years to develop. Um, we've then only just recently released some more information, but that's still too early. There's some, some slight little things coming there, not really about increased cancer incidence, but maybe about um, um, cancer risk once you've got the cancer, what, what the pro prognosis is. Maybe still too early. So that's a really strong argument to, to keep looking at that into the next 10 years. But we really see the potential for the study to actually grow and, and work with <laughs> others to do something really unusual and, and really maximise the, the value for the community. Um, so go to our website, everything's there. We've got more than 100 papers so far with much more to come this year. Uh, but now we'll go on to the panel session. So we'll come and sit up the front and Lika will pop up on the screen and maybe Jane can start with um, some of your, your, your reflections on, on what you see the values and where to the next for you. Thanks, Matthew. I think we're... So probably just some initial reflections from <clears throat> myself would be the fact that the Hazelwood Health Study was um, initiated was really important. What we know during um, the impact of the mine fire for those of us that were here working and, and living in the area is that the community's voice wasn't being heard, it wasn't being <coughs> and it put significant advocacy from a range of different people in the community to say, particularly to the Department of Health and the government, you're not hearing what our experience is, you're not acknowledging it and you're therefore not responding uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, and there was real concerns from people in the community around the impact on their health from what was burning uh, in the fire, in, in actually the, the pit of the mine. Um, so the fact that the health study was initiated uh, and has um, been going on for the last 10 years acknowledges that experience from people in the community. And I think that's really important that the community's voice was heard and there was a response in relation to that. And the other part of the way the health study has operated is it has been very transparent in the findings from the health study. So there has been um, different reports that have been released at different times, there have been different community briefings. So that um, helps to build that trust that was broken at the time of the mine fire. So the fact that um, the health study has released those reports and has had conversations and said this is what we are finding. Some of it um, reinforced what the experience of people was. Some of it said, no, this is what, what our data is telling us. So I think that's been really important from the health study's perspective and response to community experience and building trust. The other thing that we have seen, um, and, and both Matthew and, and Sue and, and Lika referred to it um, in some way, is changes uh, in our practice from um, events. So we know from the time of the mine fire that there has been other fires. And then just this week, you know, I've, I've been um, watching and, and hearing and, and looking at how we as a community are responding to uh, this week's events. It's very different from what it was 10 years ago. And so some of those learnings um, from the mine fire and our learnings as a, as a society and as a community are impacting those responses. and, and I've seen how um, community houses have responded, how um, uh, local government has responded to say, we know people don't have electricity, we know they don't have food, and these, these are the sorts of um, services that we are providing and, and enabling for people. So there is a different connected community response to an event this week than what there has been 10 years ago. What I would say is there's still work for us to do. One of the things that um, I'm conscious of is that in all of our communications, we are reliant a lot on digital connectivity. And we know this week we still don't have telecommunications for many people in our community. And so when we've got these great things occurring, how are we reaching those people in the community um, ordinarily don't have digital connectivity? And then this week do not have digital connectivity because of the telecommunications issue. So I think that's something for us as all of the community to provide, and we are talking about it before, you know, it used to be the old phone tree. Well, the phone tree is not going to work right now. 
but how do we have those connections in our community to provide that resilience that we're providing through our infrastructure and other areas. So I think that's still a space for us to think about. And I think the other thing is, um, and again, Matthew referred to it, with the health study, we've been fortunate in a way, we're not fortunate because we had the mine fire, but we did have um, poorer health and wellbeing outcomes in this area compared to other areas that were pre-existing mine fire. Uh, we've now had, and we have the opportunity of this health study, how are we collectively using the benefits of that health study? So how are we now coming together to understand the results and then taking those um, results through to, to look at how we as a service system are responding and also preventing impacts from the outset as well. So I think that's the next step that we've got is really looking at what's the results from the health study and building it into our system responses. And a really valid point about communication. It's been an interesting <laughs> Okay, so happy to open the, the floor up now for questions. And he has got one wrong line. Good morning, just curious if and how locals who moved away from the region because of the mine fire and impacts were included in the research. So we, we try to get out and get information from people. So There's a big adult survey. We actually got information from the electoral world because there was a, an election um, around that point, so it was relatively up to date. And so we tried to contact people, and if they'd moved on, we still tried to get them. Um, and, and we have tried to keep track of people over time um, and, follow, and keep following them up because that's critically important. But there's also, we, we try and get all, our, as, as Jane said, we try and put all our information up there. So anyone who's, who's moved away but still wants to get access to information, it's all up on the website. Um, our website's got so much more stuff and a lot more will come. Um, so we really want to make sure that wherever you are, you can still access our information. Shane. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks very much. <coughs> um, there's a lot of work to be done still. You've made that very clear. <clears throat> is, what's the groundswell like within the community for the study to continue? I think the conversation within the community is only just starting and it's a challenging question because, I mean, it's 10 years on and a lot of people have moved on from, from the mine fire don't want to think about the mine fire and there's a sense that if you keep reminding people, it takes us back to that point. But I think the more we can get information out about what we've got and what it means and that this is hopefully a study that if it gets to go on, will not just be about the mine fire, but I'd like to see it looking at a study of the community in transition, a study of a community that is quite exposed to, to multiple events, as we've seen this week, and that's really important information. I think there's a lot more than just the mine fire. Because even at the time, there were people who were saying, we've had these before, that's not a big deal. What we've shown is it was a big deal, but we need to build that that that. Um, relationship with the community to say there's more to come, more to happen, and we think it's it's quite important. But yeah, it's a tricky question. Thanks for asking. Can I can I add something to that? Go Lena. Okay. Um so yeah, like regarding the the elf study, we actually saw that we had um more people attending the nine years clinic than the seven years clinics, which I think really emphasized that people are still very engaged and involved and find it very important that we do monitor the kids over time um, and see what the long-term impact is as well. So, yeah, I feel like there's definitely still a big support um, among the community, at least for our stream. That's, that's a really good point for the um, psych stream follow-up to the adult survey. When we went out in 2019, 2020, we wanted 450 people. The stats tell us we need 450 people to answer the question that we needed. We got over 700 and we thought, oh, wow, we thought we were going to really be pushing hard to get to the 450. We got over 700 and we thought at the time that was because of Black Summer motivating people. We went out again two years later and we got five other, 500 of those did the third round survey. So again, a lot more than we thought and in, at a point that it wasn't being prompted by an event. So there is still that, that willingness to provide information. And the great thing is, as, as Lika mentioned, when we went out with the surveys, both the adults and the kids sought permission for data linkage. So what Lika said was we're linking data, so we're looking at 
your health records over time. We've got, I think, 80 90% for that, and that's ongoing. But well, um, um, so that means that data <coughs> people. we really don't want to have to do too much invasive things with people over time. We want to, as much as possible, use the resources that we've got to follow that health. So it's not such a big impact. So, like the, the cardiovascular stream that we did in our first round, that was a couple of hours of work. And luckily at that point, we found that there was no evidence of cardiovascular effect and no relationship with smoke. And so we said, right, well, we're not going to do that again because that's just too much effort for participants. So it's a matter of finding the right path that, that works for the participants to get the data we need. Can I ask, um, you know, there's obviously background um, um, pollution. So since the mine fire, there's been a closure of Hazelwood, that would have been a positive impact, obviously. So how do you take that into account with respect to your research? So the challenge we had with, with air pollution monitoring is there were monitors around. Not all of them were working. Not all of them were in the right spots. So we didn't have really strong monitoring data for the mine fire. We had bits and pieces. Things came on at different points. So what we ended up doing was we actually had to contract CSIRO to actually do, do monitoring for us that actually gave us a, a much more accurate estimate of, of mine fire exposure. Um, and they used satellite data and other data to do that. And that gave us basically air quality data for the years leading up to the mine fire and the years beyond the mine fire. And so we're able to then subtract out that baseline um, information to then say this is this extra bit here which I think we over something like 21 days during the mine fire period we, we, we peaked we, we went well beyond the the national air pollution standards so it was a massive pollution we we're able to separate out all the background sorts of things and we have to control for things like seasonality because there's a big change as we all know in winter everyone puts their, their, their wood, wood heaters on and there's a lot more pollution around then we've got the clean burn and so on so we're all <coughs> so yeah so it's a lot of work um, and we're getting better and better at it. different members of our teams are all, are all you know really coming up with stuff so one of these that Lika mentioned was pollution and um, just in general so we've got people who are looking at the relationship between air quality right across the country and NAPME so the sort of stuff that we've piloted in our sort of space is now being done by the group across Australia so then they'll see the changes to do with black summer and everything else. Completely academic question. I'm really curious about the Hawthorne effect in that the more you talk to people about um, how many times you go to the GP, did it actually increase the number of times they went to GP, the smaller symptoms, and therefore it's increasing your results? I just wondered if you, you know, how you kind of compensated for that. I'm not sure we can compensate for that. We're certainly very well aware of it, and it's actually one of the things that Sue includes in the community wellbeing stream and the talking to people about. Um, that is the release of Hazelwood findings actually a, a community impact? Um, so it, it's a challenging question. Uh, we certainly know from other research that, that um, I, I know one of the ones I looked at was the Oklahoma bombings, very different to what we're doing. But that, there was evidence that, that communities 100 miles away, so not in any way impacted by the bombing. This was in school age kids because that was my focus at that point. They were showing increased levels of distress because of all the media attention and so on. So it is a pathway we've got to walk where we, we don't want to forget about it, but we also don't want to make people overly concerned. But if more people are going to the GP, that's probably a positive outcome. So it is a tricky question. Can I add something to that as well? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, so I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's really difficult to distinguish between uh, whether it's like attention related that people are more aware of several symptoms. Uh, I do think since we did, we, since we did similar, uh, saw similar patterns for like really ED uh, presentations and GP visits, that you could with a quite big certainty say that there, that there is an increase in uh, like like really experience uh, the conditions and uh, even though they might be minor, uh, some of them led to like more severe presentations. So I feel like, yeah, they might not all be attributable to like an actual illness, but I would say since they since, uh, since it is consistent with ED presentations as well, that there's definitely an increased uptake. 
Well, my question was really about something you alluded to, Matthew, the, the additive effect of, of different events. And I get that you can quite easily, using the data stream that you have, look at each individual event and, and health responses. How, how do you get at that additive effect of all of those things happening to this community? I'm wondering whether there's people in your cohort who've left. They wouldn't have escaped COVID, COVID but they might have but they've left this region, they may have escaped some of those subsequent events. So as much as possible in the survey information, we've tried to actually include questions when we went after an event. Yeah, no, I mean, the challenge for the, the, the psych stream second round was it literally went out just before the fires happened. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't know the fires were going to happen, probably should have, but we didn't. So in the next one, we then asked about their level of exposure to, to COVID and Black Summer, so we are passing that out. Um, I had something in my brain, but I've just forgotten. Um, and and um, we just literally in the, in the respiratory stream, the adult respiratory stream last year, this is one thing that Brett Sutton was really keen on while he was um, um, <coughs> to make sure that we actually try as best as we can to understand these additional impacts. And so we actually included COVID blood spot testing in that, that respiratory um, round to try and, because it's very hard for people to, you know, COVID's a weird beast. Not everybody who's had COVID knew they had COVID, as far as I'm concerned. I haven't had COVID, but maybe I did. So we, we've been doing blood spot testing to try and see if there's any, any evidence there. <laughs> haven't yet got that analysed. But it's really just trying to do every way we can. But you're right, when people move away, you end up with different sets of exposures, which we then have to try and parcel through in the analysis. Can I just add to that from the community wellbeing perspective too? It's, it's, it's about the narrative that people tell about this community <laughs> and the levels of optimism or otherwise that they have that things are going to get better or stay about the same or not really improve, maybe even get a bit worse. So, you know, qualitative research can pick up on those stories that people in the community are telling about how they feel about where they live and, and the community and the level of social connection and, yeah, the, and, and what specifically is um Having an adverse impact, and you know, oh, we've forgotten about the closure. <laughs> to give an example, um, you know, we're still really from COVID. So, you know, that's the kind of thing we do in our research. And your voice also really made it clear about the long term story about the, yeah. the, the privatisation and then the effects of Black Saturday, yeah. and all the things that it has come up in front of. I think in addition to that also, it's also about the positive things yeah. that happen yeah. in our community. The fact that we have got a shift towards the future. I mean, certainly uh, in my work, a number of people were saying, what is our vision for the future? Where are we going? And I know that the transition plan, which involved a number of different people, helps to respond to that, gives people a, a view of the future. So there are, I'm not sure how you can um, cater for all the various events that, that happen and are happening to a community that is in transition. Mm. And I think a real positive, as a couple of people have mentioned, was the, the activation of the community. Yeah. The, the, I think generations ago, because it, it was a mine fire, it was part of the power sector, no one said anything about the mine. The mine was part of the family, all the stuff about Uncle Seth, all that sort of thing. But now people are more willing to, to stand up and say, no, I don't want that here, I don't want that there. The community is a lot more activated, a lot more aware, a lot more vocal. And, and the study is only here because the community has got vocal in an election period. Um, and so that, 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 you know, if it wasn't for the community standing up for itself in a really, really big way, um, that, then they wouldn't have had any of the stuff that we've got out there. Um, and I think that's been a massive part. And I know there's a question over there, but I just want to add one more comment because I want to put a plug in for the event tomorrow. And that in itself is a, a shift of um, different approach as well, is that we have a community event organised tomorrow that's been organised by community people with an enormous amount of support from services and, and departments. So that in itself is an unbeatable change. Now, I didn't see a hand up over there. Yeah. yeah, and Jane just spoke about the community event. So Jane and Sue, I'm really keen to hear how, with the community event, how will you manage that potential impact for re-traumatisation and is, are you expecting to potentially see that considering that there's that accumulative um, <coughs> trauma of the bushfires and COVID on top of everything at the moment? I can talk about the event, how the event's organised for tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm aware, you know, there's an organised group for tomorrow's event, some people that are from the community who have 
stood up enormously in organising tomorrow. And they are very conscious of having that balance between not re traumatising um, and also talking about the future. So that's where they've balanced their um, communications and the way the day is occurring is that we are acknowledging something that happened 10 years ago that did have a traumatic effect. But we've had changes since then and we're shifting towards the future. And they're also uh, very conscious of um, those from services and, and organisations that are there for them to be aware of that as well. And there is training for some people. So, uh, and there's also spaces where people can <coughs> um, talk through the impacts of that as well. So, really conscious balancing that, the messaging and then having response there at the time. And yeah, we certainly won't go to this level of detail tomorrow. No slides, that'll be hard for us. Um, but yeah, it is about tomorrow more focusing on the positive outcomes. And the panels, we're just one of many panels. <coughs> panels are more about the, the where to next, the, the community rebuilding it. So uh, hopefully, yes, a much more positive message. So I think there's a lot of positives today as well. The fact that it is positive. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> But you're right, it is something you've got to be careful for. We certainly saw in some of our earlier community briefings that there were people who were very distressed um, and, and not at all surprising because people with, with, with major health conditions that have been exacerbated by the event. Um, and, and so I think over time, it's been 10 years now, um, a, a lot of that's dropped off. As I said, with our, our second survey, we would have expected a decrease in, in the level of distress within the community. And our, the levels are not massive. We're not talking Black Saturday sorts of, of responses because it was a different sort of event. But over time, those things drop off and other things replace them as it goes into the rear window. Have you had researchers from around the world reach out to you, maybe less about the findings, but about running comparable studies into large scale health events? Yeah, actually. Um, we are trying, we, in fact, we just went two weeks ago, there was a, a group from um, um, Germany came over, the Leiden Institute, and so we, we presented them, gave them a bit of an overview of what we're doing. They're very interested. They actually had a PhD student come over last year and work with our guys in a, um, the, the Alfred Hospital. So bits and pieces of, but yeah, we are an unusual study and we hope that that it, it will have an impact. There was an editorial in the, uh, I think it was right in Journal of Medicine only about a month ago, um, where they were commenting on just one of our papers, um, and not a massive, massive paper, but the, the, the um, editor took the opportunity to say, but look what this has come from, look at the program of work that's behind it, this is really unusual, this is world leading. So it's great to see that unprompted, um, that, that journal editor stood up and just said, people need to look at this thing and realise that there's, there's something interesting. I think I said, yeah. We were just thinking about this through the lens of the health decision maker at the time of the event and, and with some of the information that's available in particular on a pick up on the NAP plan results. Obviously, decision makers have to trade off, in this case, health impacts against educational outcomes. So, a couple of questions. I guess one is have we been able to understand whether or not interruptions to education in other contexts and thinking at the moment about the Broken Hill? Example with the mould in schools, another long term disruption to education. COVID. Is this, is this um, are these findings around NAPLAN results being replicated in, in other educational disruption events? And then, secondly, do we know whether or not we could have done the disruption to education better so that we can, I guess, minimise the consequence of that in order to can, you know, try and minimise the education outcomes while still protecting health outcomes? How do we? How do we get these trade-offs right? Do we have enough information now to make them better next time? There's certainly evidence that these sorts of events, other events, have had an educational impact. Um, Black Saturday, the Beyond Bushfire study has found similar sorts of things. Oddly enough, our, our um, um, impacts are higher than Black Saturday's work. I think because of what happened to the schools, because of the confusion that happened at the beginning, because no one knew what this thing was, how fast we should respond. And, so, and then there was the, the, what we heard was the kids had to turn up to school and then get on a bus and get for the couple of schools that did relocate to Maui. So they were literally losing probably an hour at the beginning of the day, hour at the end of the day. Uh, and they couldn't be driven straight to Maui. They had to go to their actual home school to go because of oh and issues or whatever, and that was causing a lot of distress within families. Why can't I just drive? I think in the end they may have resolved it, but early on it was just 
because no one knew what this thing was. No one knew how long it would last, even though the people in the mine said, there's a fire on the mine, it's going to take a long time to put it out once it's in. Um, but no one really understood that this was a public health event. So if we now know that, that, that a fire event, a smoke event, is an important impact and respond to it quickly and find a more um, um, direct way to get the kids to a different location rather than, than bringing them into more well in the middle of the smoke event and then busting them up and that sort of thing. It, it's challenging. We, we've, we have tried to have conversations with the, the Department of Education, but they're always in the middle of the next event. Um, um, and so it's, it's a bit challenging to try and come together and, and come up with, with new new ways of doing better. But hopefully this year that's our focus is to really go up to, to all of these guys and actually see what we can do. So as Sue said, we've been very much talking in the last little while. Thanks to our, we've got a, a community input group through the Latrobe Health Assembly. And Diane, who's our, our, our chair there, has been, well, what's, it, what's this mean? What's this going to change? So she's really been driving us to go out and she's been spearheading the conversations with the emergency management planning groups. And so that's been good because we can, we can try and say, well, one, this is a smoke event because it's not on their agenda yet. And it should have been because Black Saturday, Black Summer, us, it's big events. Um, um, we think that there's plans that can be specifically made about which groups should, should be um, looked after, even if it's as much as um, um, the um, K95 K masks that we're all used to now or the air filtration things that, that we, we can do. And so we've, we've got a, a research project that's kicking off this year looking at air filtration in schools to mitigate pollution events. And the good thing is all the schools have got air filters now because of COVID. Um, so it's <coughs> happening. It's just a matter of getting all the colour less to actually make really change. And I think the observation that I would share as well in, in decision making, why not say I think there still more needs to be done in understanding those trade-offs <laughs> and those decisions are made. But I think you know, the observation during COVID-19 was that health wasn't seen as the second cousin. So it was about balancing health with economic development. Um, and, you know, people have different views around what was prioritised for and, and the impacts of that. But there's at least an acknowledgement of that. And I think the other thing is what we see with the, the decisions is that there's more communication about the rationale now. So if there is something that is a trade-off, there is an explanation of that. So I think that's been a shift from what occurred 10 years ago. Thanks, everyone. We might leave it there from a timing point of view. So please... Um, Yes, yeah, really great um, conversations and uh, yeah, I wasn't aware of the level of detail that's been put into the, to the report and the study, so it's really uh, valuable data that's come out of that, so um, thank you. And yeah, just um, join with me to thank all of our speakers today. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for joining us online as well. So. Um, just for our next um, breakfast event, which will be on the 20th of March, we're having a slightly different format. It'll be a, a workshop event focusing on stigma, which will be presented and facilitated by um, the, some of the youth from our local Latrobe Valley region. Um, and then also next week we're starting a, um, a lunchtime event series on Friday, which will um, be looking at um, a future towards net zero, so if anybody would like to join us. There's some details on, on the flyers as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. There's more breakfast in the foyer, so please um, get, continue the conversations and have some more coffee. Thank you, Lisa.